The reading today is from Psalm chapter 42. For the director of music, a mascal of the sons of Korah. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears have been my food day and night. While people say to me all day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. My soul is downcast within me. Therefore, I will remember you from the land of the Jordan, the heights of Hermon, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. By day, the Lord directs his love. At night, his song is with me. A prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? My bones suffer mortal agony, as my foes taught me, saying to me all day long, Where is your God? Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. Thanks, everyone. Well, how are you going? No, no, seriously, how are you going? Like, I mean, how many times do we get asked that question on a day-to-day -day basis? I mean, chances are, if you're a hardcore Aussie, you might not say how are you going, you might say, scarn on. Uh, you know, how, how do you guys go to that? Scarn on. But just think for a moment, chat to the person next to you, maybe. Uh, how many times a day do you think you've been asked how are you going in this morning? Or, or even in the last week. Have a go. Turn the person next to you. How many times do you reckon? Not today. Uh, well, no, I have. <laughs> <laughs> Alrighty, I'm going to interrupt those conversations. Uh, I'm going to take a stab in the dark and guess that's been quite a lot. It's been a little bit more than just a handful. Now, I wonder how you answered that. I mean, maybe you didn't at all. Maybe you just went, yeah, good day, how are you? Or maybe you said, yeah, not too bad, thanks, yourself, before you even took the time to think it through. But if it really scratched beneath the surface, if, if you felt comfortable enough to be honest, to take stock and be honest, how do you think you'd answer it? As a Christian, let alone as a pastor, I feel like there's a big pressure to say, I'm going well, I'm going good, I'm doing very well, thank you very much. You know, to, to have it all together, to be joyful, to be someone who always feels full, so that I can fill other people, so that I can give and give and give, so I can be in this Sunday mode, where I'm overjoyed, where I'm raising my hands in worship, where I'm singing so joyfully. How are you going? Well, the psalm we're looking at today, Psalm 42, was the inspiration behind a Christian song from the 80s. I don't know if any of you know it, the, uh, as the deer pants it. Anyone, hands up? Anyone know that one? Yep, yep, I've got some of the lyrics up on the screen behind me, actually. Uh, it sounds a little bit like the Sunday mode version of Psalm 42. I mean, this song, it's a song full of confidence and trust in God. It's a song that's so full of, of goodness. You, know, you alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. I mean, no wonder my friends had sung at their wedding. It's so happy. It's so trusting in God. It just feels this great sense of rest. I mean, next picture, even the misheard lyrics version of this song is still kind of fun. But when we read Psalm 42, it just feels worlds apart from this kind of picture, from this kind of song, doesn't it? It's not how the psalmist feels, is it? Now, I'm a bit of a high-energy person. 
And I'm pretty optimistic. So normally I can be the Sunday morning kind of guy who's, who's full of life, who's delighted to worship God. But there are times when I'm not. There are times when I'm empty. There are times when I'm running on fumes. I wonder if you've felt that way. I wonder if just the, the energy that gets sucked out of the room when, when we can't sing in church, when, when everyone's wearing masks and we can only see half of each other's faces. Uh, okay. Let alone the rest of everything that's gone on these past couple of years. I mean, I wonder if you're feeling that way now. Feeling empty. Feeling in a state of spiritual dryness. Feeling isolated, numb. Feeling like you've got nothing in the tank. How are you going? It's a pretty high feeling. And if that's you today, then the Bible actually has some really good news. See, as we look through Psalm 42, which Jane read for us, we see that you're not alone if you feel that way. You are not alone. It's actually a normal experience in the life of someone who worships God to feel empty sometimes. We see here that even the most devoted followers of God can feel empty. But how we feel isn't who we are. There's something far more important about us than when we come to God, than how we feel. And ultimately, we never come empty because of Jesus. So if you're not taking time, uh, there's some spaces to fill in the blanks in there if you want to, to, to write into your notes. Uh, I encourage you to keep your Bibles open, but let's dive in. Let's get into Psalm 42. I mean, check out the first three verses of this song with me. They show us how empty this follower of God feels. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When can I go and meet with God? My tears will be my food day and night, while people will say to me all day long, where is your God? As the deer pants. As the deer craves water. Now there's a picture up on the screen behind me. It's, it's of the Torrens River back in 2009, or more specifically, the lack of of a Torrens River back in 2009. Um, it's right near where I work now. Now, <laughs> does anyone, was anyone near the city or go past the Torrens River back in 2009 when it was drained, anyone? I mean, at the best of times, the Torrens River smells bad. But when it was drained, it stank. It had the stench of death. I mean, it was disgusting. There was a car that was pushed out from in there. Now, this was a drying riverbed which stank like death. And as much as I think the Torrens River stinks, it's normally abundant with life. I mean, there's ducks, there's, there's all kinds of birds coming around, there's swans, there's a rare pelican that comes into the Torrens. And all of a sudden, it was empty. I mean, if it was left for a bit longer, this kind of image would have become this kind of image. You know, it would have become even drier. It would have looked barren. Abandoned, empty. I mean, can you imagine a duck going back to the place where it had grown up? You know, following the normal migration patterns, coming back to the place where it had been as it was young, when it was raised as a duckling, where it had grown up, where it would always come back year after year after year, where it raised ducklings year after year. Imagine that duck coming back and finding nothing. Dryness, barrenness, emptiness. All the patterns, all the habits, everything that this duck had trusted, all of a sudden, meant nothing. I mean, that's how this songwriter is feeling. He's like the deer that rocks up to the usual watering hole, only to find it dry. To find it barren. To find it empty. But not empty of water. Now, this isn't a, a literal thirst. This is a spiritual thirst, a spiritual emptiness. We saw there in verse 3, he's socially isolated. People around him are mocking him, saying, where is your God? He's completely lost. He's empty. He's dry. But not only that, it's not from a lack of effort. Look with me at verse 4. These things I remember as I pour out my soul, how I used to go to the house of God under the protection of the mighty one with shouts of joy and praise among the festive throng. 
We see him remembering these habits, these rituals that he's done. You know, in religious festivals. I mean, that's the ancient equivalent of going on a church weekend away or on a youth camp. Now he's gone to the temple, the ancient equivalent of being in God's lounge room or of meeting together with God for a meal with other people. Now he's, he's done these things. He remembers these things. Well, look with me down at verse 9. He prays to God. In his prayers, this son of Korah expresses his feeling of being abandoned by God. Verse 9, I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why must I go about mourning, oppressed by the enemy? He's done all the religious habits. He's ticked every religious box. And what does he have to show for it? Nothing. His soul, his spirit, they're downcast. He's smushed into the dirt. He feels at an all-time low. He feels hollow, a shell of a man who used to gather together with all these other people and praise God. What about you? How do you feel? Now maybe you're someone who's a follower of God, a, a Christian. Now maybe you're like the songwriter here, maybe you feel empty right now. Oh, well, if that's you, if you're someone here who, like this songwriter, feels empty, then there's something important to know. There's something important that this song teaches us. There's an important truth. It's okay. It's okay to feel empty. I mean, maybe, like this songwriter, you're asking where God is. Why isn't He right here? Why can't I feel Him with me? I used to feel so on fire for God, and now, empty. Or maybe you feel abandoned. Maybe you feel like God's left you. How could God have let this happen? How could God have let her get cancer? How could God let him get dementia? Whether it's a broken relationship or the brokenness of the body or, or the chaos that a global pandemic throws at us, then you might feel like life is really messed up and wonder if God even cares. You know, the marriage that suddenly comes to an end. The aging parent, who every day you see less and less of them. Now I get it. I have my days where I feel like God's a man. I have my days where I question where God is when I feel empty. Here's what the song tells me, though. Here's what Psalm 42 tells us. It tells me not to keep it to myself. It tells me to pour it out to God. To really open up to God and tell Him how I'm feeling. Now, sometimes for me, it's been a long conversation with God as I've gone for a walk outside. Sometimes it's been shouting into a pillow or, or just screaming in a car. Expressing how we feel to God. I mean, have you actually told God how you're feeling? Have you actually admitted to God that you feel empty? Because you can. What the psalmist here tells us, what he shows us, is that it's absolutely okay to tell God. But more than that, unlike the people who surrounded this psalmist in Psalm 42, you can look around you in this room. You're actually surrounded by men and women here at Trinity Church, Victor Harbour, who know God, who would love to care for you, who would love to support you and walk alongside you as you express these things to God. You might even just sit there next to you as you cry. You know, maybe it's your growth group. Maybe it's someone you've seen up on stage today. Maybe it's someone that you know you've been praying with for a long time. Or maybe it's just someone sitting right next to you what would it look like to, to just talk to each other and share how you're actually going, how you're actually feeling? Can I encourage you to do that, whether it's a good time or a bad time? It's absolutely okay to feel empty. So when you feel empty, you can talk to God. You can talk to our community. We can share it with each other. But this song also tells us that there's someone else 
we need to talk to. We need to talk to ourselves. It's there in Psalm 42, repeated twice. Did you hear it? Look at me at verse 5, the first time it's mentioned. Why, my soul, are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Saviour and my God. See, the psalmist is talking to himself. And not just in the kind of way that I do when I'm walking down Woolies and going, oh, great, I need to get milk, I need to go that way. No, he's not just doing that kind of self-reminder thing. No, he's, he's talking to himself with intentionality. He's talking to himself deliberately. See, he doesn't just sit there and let his feelings own who he is. He looks at himself in the mirror and he tells himself to put his hope in God. He says that this feeling of emptiness is not permanent. He tells himself that he will praise God again, fully. He will soon praise his Saviour and his God. Now, the reason that this song made it into Israel's hottest 150 charts is because it's a song for us too. But see, the right response when we're feeling empty isn't to just wait until we feel better. It isn't just to avoid Christian community. It isn't just to stop doing the things that don't seem to work anymore. It's not to pretend that we're not empty. It's not to fake it or be artificial. No, the right response is to recognize that there's something more true about ourselves than how we feel. To recognize that how we feel is not who we are. So let me say that one again. How you feel is not who you are. I mean, do you get that? Just because I feel numb doesn't make me numb. Just because I feel empty doesn't mean I'm empty. We have to be so careful of letting our feelings dictate who we are. Michael Barrett, a Christian scholar, printed a bit of this quote in your outlines. And he talks about the circumstances of life in this way. The circumstances of life, those in our private little worlds or in the larger world around us, have the potential to create a tension in our hearts between experience and creed. That is what we believe about God. When experience assumes precedence over creed, we don't feel much like worshipping. Walking by sight is always deleterious to walking by faith. The Psalms direct us to factor God into current situations. True religion is always relevant to life. It is good in worship to dwell on God's faithfulness and the sensibility of trusting Him regardless. Praising God tends to put everything else in proper perspective, even life. Praising God tends to put everything else in proper perspective. Walking by sight, trusting how we feel. And he says it right there, it's damaging. And we know this to be true, don't we? If I'm just relying on how I'm feeling in any given moment, then life's going to be pretty dark, tough. You know, to, to use a little bit of an analogy, okay, back when I was a teen, I became pretty interested in surfing. Anyone surfing here? Yep, got a few hands showing and trying to, yep. Yeah. Um, now, I became really interested in it, I was no good at it. The only thing I got to learn well how to do was how to fall off my board well. That's the important thing, I think. Um, I came down to Middleton for lessons, and I brought my board down when I turned 16, because I got one, it was really fun. I was no good by how off. Now, when you're surfing, one of the biggest risks is when you wipe out, when you fall off the board, when you get knocked off your board by a wave. And one of the biggest risks when you fall off is losing your calm. It's losing sight of where you are. It's, it's just being tossed around by the waves. See, when you lose your calm, you start to panic, you take up more oxygen, you try to inhale while you're underwater, that's really bad, don't try it. And you end up a danger to yourself, you end up a danger to the others in the water around you. Now, when the waves go over, when they spin you around, you kind of tumble under the water, you've got your, your leash somewhere on your leg, still attached to the board somewhere out there, it can be so disorienting. Right? You get turned around, you don't know which way is up, especially if it's a murky day out at Middleton, it's all mucky under the water, and, and you can't really see the sky because it's all cloudy as well. If you're not careful, you won't come up. See, that's why the leash, the guide rope that's tied to your board is so important. Because when you stop turning over, when you stop spinning around, even if you can't see the way up, you know which way is up. Because you can rely on something outside of yourself, something outside of how you feel, something outside of where you think up is. You can rely on the guide rope, on the leash that's attached to your leg. 
You follow it up and you get to your board. You get to the service. And it's the same thing with worshipping God. Worship helps us to see things exactly as they are. No matter how much we tumbled over or how disoriented we are, worshipping God helps us get things into the right perspective. So back to our psalm then. Let me repeat one of those lines again. I will yet praise him, my saviour and my God. How does he describe this God? God is saviour. Which means that this songwriter is someone who has been saved. To him, this is even more important than how he feels. He is someone who's saved. Something foundational about him that can't be changed, no matter how he feels, no matter the circumstances around him. He is someone who is saved. See, this is trustworthy for your time for him. God is his saviour. This trust is the guide rope, the leash which the sons of Korah used to orient themselves, to know the right way up, even when they're underwater and feeling wave after wave go over them, like verse 7 describes. They have a guide rope to pull them up. They have something unchangeable about God they can trust. God's their saviour. But how is God... His Savior. How is God their Savior? I mean, this is before Jesus, isn't it? <laughs> well, we don't really get an explanation in this psalm, do we? Now, it's just something that's assumed about God. He is Savior. But I think we do get a clue. See, something breaks the cycle in this psalm a little bit. In verse 8, we see the psalmist say, By day the Lord directs his love. All the rest of this psalm... The name for God has been a pretty generic one. It's been God, or the Mighty One. But when we get the name Lord in capitals, like we do here in verse 8, it's just the English way of putting the personal name of God, Yahweh. See, that's the name God revealed to Moses back in Exodus, when he first saved the people of Israel. When he first saved them, which means that if you were an Israelite, your fundamental identity was someone who was saved by Yahweh. It was your national story. It was your personal story. It was the fundamental truth of who you are. You were someone saved by Yahweh. It was the biggest salvation event provided by God. If you were an Israelite, you could know God personally, and you knew Him as your Savior. <laughs> this happened hundreds of years before the sons of Korah wrote this psalm. And yet, that's what enabled them to suffer and still resolve to put their hope in God. It's because he's their saviour. And they've got the historical proof of it. Well, so what about us? Not many of us today would be in the boat of going to the temple during Passover and remembering God's salvation in the land of Judah, just like the psalmist. Maybe you're someone here for the first time today. You're just checking Christianity out. I mean, if that's you, welcome. I'm so glad you're here. Christians aren't people who are happy or have it all together all the time. I hope you can see that just by looking at the psalm. No, that hasn't been my experience. No, but if you felt empty, empty. If you felt alone and like you don't really have it together, that's actually a really good place to come and meet God. Because anyone who's a Christian will tell you all that God requires is people who don't have it all together. Keep checking out. Keep getting to know him. Meet this Jesus. Or maybe on the other hand, you're a Christian here. You felt it. Maybe you felt abandoned by God. Maybe you're feeling that way right now. I really don't want to brush over that. Like our psalmist, Christians are people who are saved. See, we have a salvation event that shapes us. A salvation that's our guide rope. It was 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross and was raised to life. Jesus is our Savior. Jesus saves us. He takes on the pain and the bitterness of this life and he gives us healing. Jesus was actually abandoned, actually left empty. So that we never have to. 
And not only that, Jesus gives us healing. See, one day in Jesus' life, he met a woman who, like our songwriter in Psalm 42, was empty. And she knew it. Listen to Jesus' words to her from John chapter 4, verses 13 and 14. Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Jesus alone presents a way out of us being empty. He offers us deep, ultimate, thirst-quenching salvation. He offers it to us freely. So is Jesus your Savior? And if you're not a Christian, check him out. Get to know Jesus. I can promise you he is a good Savior. But on the other hand, if you are a Christian, Jesus is your Savior. So when you're feeling empty, when you're feeling isolated, abandoned, tossed around, Jesus is still your Savior. He's still the guide Now how do we do this? How do we recenter our lives? We worship God. We look our feelings directly in the eye and say, yep, I'm feeling empty. I'm feeling abandoned. I'm feeling isolated. But I'm not. I'm saved. See, we, we get filled with Jesus. I'm not saying that it's easy. But what a joy to be in a Christian community together where we can speak to one another with psalms, with hymns, with spiritual songs. We can encourage each other. We can pray together. We can talk about everything that God's doing in our world with each other after the service, during the gathering. We can meet midweek and be encouraged by God's word. So here's just one takeaway from this psalm for us this week. Practice talking to yourself. Do what this psalmist does. See, take any emotion that you feel when you can you remember it. Whether it's emptiness, whether it's joy, whether it's drained, feeling a bit meh, whatever it is, take one of those feelings. Reflect on it. Talk to yourself. Put yourself under the microscope. Why are you feeling this way? What's making you feel this way? And how does Jesus make it better? Let's talk to God now. Dear God, thank you that us, you are our Saviour. Thank you that even when we're disoriented, empty, or feeling abandoned, you are our Saviour. Help us to know you. Help us to be filled with your living water, as Jesus promised. It's in his name we pray. Amen.